Well, I hope a number of you are reading your Bibles, and that's one of our uh, main focuses as a church in, in 2024 especially. And tonight, I'm excited uh, to kick off what we call the Vineyard. For those of you who are already a part of the vine or are interested in getting to, to get, be a part of the vine, the daily Bible study where we spend time together online. But then uh, tonight we're going to have the kickoff to our uh, evening gathering or weekly gathering. And tonight we're going to have special music by the Master Servants, a testimony by Stephen Lupson. We're going to have a lesson over what we've read this week in the Word and then time to break out in groups and to build relationships and pray uh, for one another. So I hope to see you tonight at 6.30 at the Vineyard. Also, before I get into the message, next Sunday is going to be Sanctity of Life Sunday, and uh, we are going to be having our baby dedication. And so if you have a, a child that's been born since our last one, or you've not been a part of a prayer of dedication over these young lives, we invite you to uh, inform us. We'd love to include their names in this, and uh, if you can be present, just uh, email Debbie at Debbie at CarpentersChristian.Church, uh, and, and if you'll give the name of the child, uh, the birth date, name of the parents, and which service you plan to attend, we'd love to include you in that time next Sunday. So last Sunday, we began a series of messages entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective Christians. And in this series, we're going to look at foundational disciplines and practices that will grow your faith and enrich your walk with God if you'll apply them uh, in this coming year. And, and today, I want to, uh, last week, we talked about the importance of the Word and abiding in the Word. Today, we're going to talk about prayer in conjunction with that. And of course, there's five other habits. It's my belief that if you commit to the word and to prayer, these first two, that let them be the foundation, those other five will flow naturally from that. And so uh, these two are of primary importance. Before we get to the serious part, though, the joke is told about a little boy uh, who was, uh, went to his dad one day and said, Dad, I, I, I wish I could have a little brother. Well... The dad happened to know that uh, the little boy's mom was, was expecting, and they hadn't really explained all that yet, and they happened to already know that it was going to be a boy. But he thought, I'll, I'll use this to um, teach him something about prayer. And he said, he said, well, son, he said, I bet you if you pray and you really commit over the next several weeks to pray uh, for a baby brother, I bet you God will give you a baby brother. And so he did. He went into his room, shut the door, and he prayed and prayed. The next night, he prayed and prayed. And for several days now, he, he prayed. But then, as little boys often do, he forgot. And he, he thought, well, nothing's happened yet. And he, he quit praying. Well, the time came for the baby to be born. They went to the hospital. He, uh, he, uh, his dad took him into the room. And there was his mom. And she was holding this little bundle. And, and uh, he took him over. And the dad held his son up. And he said, look. And he pulled, they pulled back the covers, and there was not one, but two baby brothers there. And, and the dad said to the little boy, he said, now, aren't you glad that you prayed for a little brother? And the little boy said, yeah. He said, aren't you glad that I quit praying for him when I did? Because <laughs> he thought, man, my prayers are powerful <laughs> and effective. Well, today, I want to start with this question, uh, why pray? What's the big deal about prayer? God knows everything anyway. Am I really telling him anything that he, he doesn't know? Well, I'm going to give you two simple answers to that question. Then we're going to dive a little deeper. But the first simple answer is we should pray because Jesus prayed. Jesus was committed to prayer. In Mark 1, it says, In rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place where he prayed. Now, that's just one example, but we see this throughout Jesus' life. He was, prayer was central to everything that he did. I find it fascinating that Jesus did two things that you would think Jesus wouldn't have to do. One is prayer, because after all, he is one with the Father. So why did Jesus, of all people, need to pray? And was he talking to himself when he was praying because he was God in the flesh? But we know today he was the Son communicating and staying perfectly aligned with the will of the Father. Secondly, Jesus was baptized. He had no sins to be washed away. But when John asked him, why should I be baptized? He said, we should do this to fulfill all righteousness. And so... In those two things, Jesus was our example 
If the Son of God saw that it was important to stay connected to the Father through prayer, how much more important is it for you and I? Secondly, the disciples were devoted to prayer. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, we, we find this verse. It says, they all met together and were constantly united in prayer, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. When you read throughout the book of Acts, they were frequently in prayer. That just seemed to be what they did when they came together. They spent much time as believers together in prayer. It was the rhythm of their life. And they... We seem to notice, they seem to notice the connection in Jesus' life. These people who had spent time with Jesus, not coincidentally, they spent a lot of time in prayer. And they had prayed before. They had seen and heard people pray before. But when they watched Jesus pray, they seem to notice there's something, there's something about the way he prays. So these people who had probably been around prayer their whole life, they come to Jesus, these disciples did, and they say, Teach us how to pray. Teach us because we've never prayed like that and we've never seen results like that. Teach us, Jesus, how to pray. The scripture records that Jesus responded to that request by giving them the model prayer that's often known as the Lord's Prayer. Now, I don't think that Jesus gave us this model prayer and said, pray this exact prayer and recite it verbatim and because a lot of times we do that and we just say the words and we don't even think about what we're saying, we just mindlessly repeat it. I don't think that was the intent. But I think Jesus was saying, pray a prayer like this. And he gave us several elements of prayer that I want to take a look at quickly this morning. First, we see in the model prayer that prayer is a means of praising God. In verse 9 of Matthew 6, it says, Jesus says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name is a, a, a fancy way of saying that God should be kept holy. His name should be respected and revered as the name above all names. And, and sometimes when we pray, I believe we should pray not to ask of anything, but just to pray and say, God, you are awesome. And just to praise him. I, maybe you've done this and not even realized you were doing it. Maybe you have uh, been driving to work in the morning and you just saw the most amazing sunrise and maybe you, like me, you just said, God, that is awesome. You didn't have to make sunrises beautiful, but you did. Man, I give you praise this morning. That's a prayer of praise. Maybe you've stood outside on a starless, I mean, a star-filled, a clear night and just looked up at the stars and thought, God, how big are you? How vast, how powerful, you are, so, you are beyond my brain's ability to understand or even fathom how vast you are. I worship you. Maybe you stood on the beach and considered, who am I that God even knows my name, much less died to save my soul? God, I give you praise. Those are prayers of praise that honor and respect the name of God. Next, we see that we should pray the will of God. He goes on in verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to say this clearly. Prayer is not a way to get God to do our will. It's not. Many times we treat it that way, but prayer is not a way to pull God to us. It's a means of humbling ourselves before God and submitting our will to his it's not telling God what to do. It's inviting him to come and do his will in us. And there's a huge difference. It's a means of aligning our agenda, our priorities, our thoughts, and our actions with his. And saying, God, may your kingdom come. Your will be done in me, in my home, in my church, in all areas of my life. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next of all, we see that prayer is a means of accessing God's provision. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread, Jesus prayed. God knows everything that you need. He just wants you to come and ask him for it. Because I'm convinced that God wants us to see how that whole process works, that there are things that you cannot access without God. If you woke up this morning, it's because God decided to give you another day of life. 
If you just breathed in and out in the last few seconds, it's because God decided to give you another breath. And many times, we're, we're dependent upon God every day, but there are times in our life when we realize it more than others. And God says, if you have a need, just come to me because I love to you, for you to see that I'm your provider. Everything you have and will ever need, it comes from me. Don't be prideful or stubborn and say, I don't ask God for anything for myself. That might sound noble, but it's not biblical. God says, come to me with your needs. I want to hear the desires of your heart. I think it's okay to bring our desires to him. As long as we say, God, this is what I would like to see, but I submit this to your will. But even Jesus, think about the, the prayer that he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before he would die. What did he say at the beginning? Father, if it's possible that this cup could be taken from me, could you take it? Because my desire of the flesh, I don't really want to go to the cross. But when the answer came back, no, my son, you, it must be this way, then powerfully Jesus said, but not my will, but thine be done. Thy will be done. And that's the same way we should present ours. I think it's okay to come to God and say, God, here's what I would like to see happen in my life, in my marriage, in my family. But Lord, you do what you know is best. But this is what I would like to see if it be within your, your will. Give us this day our daily bread. Prayer is a way to confess our sins and receive the forgiveness of God. Verse 12, it says, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. We're not telling God something he doesn't already know. He knows about your sin. He just wants you to own it. He wants you to take responsibility for it and acknowledge that he, you know that he knows about your sin. And we're taking responsibility for it. We're humbling ourselves before God and seeking his forgiveness with a repentant heart. And listen, don't just say, God, forgive me for my sins. I think it's good to say, God, forgive me, and be specific. God, forgive me for losing my temper around my spouse this morning. God, forgive me for those impure thoughts I had earlier today. God, forgive me for not coming to you in prayer enough and not thinking about you and being preoccupied with other things. Whatever it is, confess it to God. And the scripture assures us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Next, we see that prayer is a way to overcome temptation. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, there are certain temptations that when I got serious about following Christ, I just read in the Bible, you know, Christians shouldn't do these things. And I thought, okay. Now that I know better, I'll do better. And I quit doing those things. But then there were other things that still today, I know they're not the will of God, but I'm like the Apostle Paul that says, I know the things I shouldn't do, but yet I find myself doing those things. Anybody here relate to that? And I still struggle. The flesh and the spirit, sometimes the flesh wins out. And, and I need help. I have proven over and over again, I can't free myself from these, these temptations. And God, I need your Holy Spirit. I need power from on high to help free me from these old habits and these old patterns of living. Would you help me? And God can give us the power to overcome temptation. Target those temptations with specific prayer and ask him to deliver you. Verse 41 of Matthew 26, Jesus says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing. I want to do the right thing, but the flesh is weak. God, I need your help. And maybe somebody today needs to begin praying that way over an area of your life where you need freedom. You need victory. Next of all, we, we should pray to seek God's will on choices that we make. Jesus, before he would call his disciples, he, he spent a night in prayer, uh, all night in prayer, the scripture says. Luke 6, one day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be his apostles. And there are various examples of the apostles doing the same later. When they had a big decision to make, they bathed it in prayer. And friend, I would encourage you, if you're facing some big decisions or even smaller decisions. If you don't have to decide right away, first bathe it in prayer and ask God to lead you and give you a peace and a confirmation in your heart before you move. 
Seek God's will on choices that you make. James 1 verse 5 says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Well, then comes the question, well, how, how do we pray? I know that it's just talking to God, but it just seems like those people that I see at church, they, they know how to pray and I don't feel like I know how to pray. Well, here are some keys I think to effective prayer. Number one, we should pray with a repentant heart. If we have sin in our lives that we're not willing to repent of, it can block the effectiveness of our prayers. Now, what I did not say right there is that if we have sin in our lives, our prayers don't get through. What I did say was if we have sin in our lives that we are not serious about repenting of, that we have no intention of turning from, but we say, ah, 95% of my life, I'm obeying God. This other 5%, I'm not really interested in changing that. I, I think that can hinder our prayers. And, and if you think I'm just making this up, the Bible has plenty to say about the connection between effective prayer and a repentant heart that strives to obey God in all things. Here's just a few. Psalm 66, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. First Peter 3, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Proverbs 15, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. First Peter 4, and the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. There's a connection between our commitment to walking in repentance and obeying God and the effectiveness of our prayers. So we need to be serious about coming before him with clean hands and a clean heart. One of the first keys to effective prayer is to make sure you're sincere and you're committed to obeying God. James 5 verse 16 says it this way, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You know, many Christians spend their week uh, sowing their wild oats and then they come to church and they pray for crop failure that they won't catch up to them. And if that's the case, you shouldn't expect much in your prayer life. Prayer is a matter for people with devoted hearts, serious about obeying their Lord. Secondly, commit to the process of prayer. There may be times when you pray about something and the answer just comes right away. I've had a few of those where I like pray one day and then the next day it's like, whoa, you know, it kind of gives you cold chills. But that's not usually how it works for me. I find that more often than not, I pray and I pray and I pray. And at some point, it might be weeks, it might be months, there might be years and it's a process involved of praying for something. You must commit to praying for a period of time. Jesus taught the disciples this principle of persistence in prayer. In Luke chapter 11, it says, then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. And you say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed, I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he'll get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. Now I'm not trying to portray God as this God that's sitting up there going, I'm not giving you anything. And we just got to keep badgering him to death until he answers our prayers. But he's saying, take that same mindset though. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to come to your house and knock on your door at 2 a.m. unless there's something vitally important. And when we come to God and we say, God, I'm going to stand here and knock until you hear my prayer. And God sees that urgency that would compel us to be so bold. It's that kind of prayer moves heaven. Jesus taught his disciples the principle of asking, seeking, and knocking. Luke chapter 11 goes on, and so I tell you, ask, and, and, and some translations say ask, seek, and knock, but actually the, the, the word that's used there is 
ongoing. And it, the, the, a better reading is keep on asking and you'll receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you'll find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Now that's powerful. I think it's worth looking at what is involved in asking, seeking, and knocking as we pray. Well, first of all, when we ask, we're laying out our will before God. And that's kind of what we talked about a while ago. God, I don't know where to start with this, but here's what I think would be best. Here's what I'm asking and we lay it out before God with the understanding, God, if, if this is not your will, and if you know this is not the best, I submit this to your will. But here it is. We ask. The Bible says sometimes we don't ask or we don't have because we don't ask. Philippians 4 says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Put it out there. And I believe it's okay to start with what you think would be best but submit it to his will. Secondly, seek. Seek the will of God in the situation. Maybe you've got a Bible concordance. That's a good place to start. Start with what you think would be best, but then get, get that and go to the concordance and look up the verses that speak to whatever it is you're praying about. If you don't have a concordance, you can go online and, and type in on a search engine, what does the Bible say about? And it'll bring up verses that, and, and read everything you can about what the Bible says about that. And here's what I do know. When you line your prayers up with the truth, you're ready to pray some powerful prayers. Line your prayers up with and seek the will of God on that situation. After getting to see what the word has to say about it and praying in harmony with that, also pay attention to what the spirit of God is doing or is not doing in conjunction to your prayers. There have been times when I have started with what I thought was best and asked God for something and after a period of time, I just felt the Spirit tell me, don't pray for that anymore. That's not what I'm doing. And I changed my prayers. And those new prayers were more fruitful. And God, the Spirit of God, will sometimes guide us. Watch for open and closed doors. Watch for where God is moving and where he's not se seeming to be moving. Seek the will of God as you pray. Thirdly, knock. We should remain committed to praying until the answer comes. Don't give up. The answer to your prayer might be one more day, one more prayer away. It may come in a different way than you expected. If you're not careful, you may miss the answer and mistake it for a non-answer. But remain committed to praying over it until you see God move. Sometimes we just have to persist in prayers. Some folks pray for things for years. I think of my grandmother in a prayer that she prayed for one of my family members. She prayed for him for years. And after she passed away, the, the, the person she was praying for came to salvation. And I think all those years she prayed, she might not have gotten to see it, but I hope God pulled back the curtain and let her see the fruit of all of her prayers over the years. We keep, need to keep knocking. Colossians chapter 4 says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it. Now, if you're going to pray over something, pay attention to what God's doing. You'll miss the miracle. You'll miss the provision. Being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Be sure to come back and praise God when you do see him move in conjunction with your prayers. Years ago, I listened to an audio book by Mark Batterson called The Circle Maker. And in this fascinating book about prayer, Batterson tells the story of a Jewish scholar from the first century B.C., and his name was Honi, I'm going to mess this up, Ha-Magel uh, is my best pronunciation of that, but Honi for, uh, for today, okay? Now, he's not mentioned in the Bible, I want to be clear about that, but the Jewish Talmud describes him as a great man of faith who saw miracles happen in response to his faith-filled prayers, now, there's one particular story that goes like this. In Israel, uh, typically winter is there. What's winter here is their growing season there. And they typically get most of their rain uh, during that, that season. But one year they didn't get the rain like they normally did. And it was well into the season and they were really desperate for rain. And so Honey, it said... He began praying and he took and he drew a circle on the ground and he stood in that circle and he said, God, I'm not leaving this circle until you answer my prayers and bring rain to this land. Now you might think, well, that's kind of bold. 
to be ordering God around and saying, this is why I'm, I'm staying in this circle till you do what I want you to do. But, but wait, he kept praying and persisting in prayer. And when it began to drizzle, Honey declared that that isn't the rain that I am asking for. Well, then it began to pour, and, and Honey said, that's not the rain I'm asking for either. I'm asking for a calm, steady rain that will soak into the ground, and eventually that's what he got. I don't know about you, but I found that challenging, inspiring. How do you get to a place where you can draw a circle and say, I'm not moving from this spot, God, until you answer this prayer? Is that even right to do that, to be so audacious in prayer? I think it depends on why you draw the circle. You see, the point's not just to run out and start drawing circles and telling God what you want him to do. The question of the day is, how do we know where to draw the circle? How do we know what to pray for? How do we know when the time comes to stand in faith and in bold declaration in prayer? I think, first of all, we need to learn to pray in faith, which, how do we do that? Mark 11 says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now, I'm not just talking about wishful thinking. I'm not talking about wishing on a star and all your dreams will come true. Prayer is not simply a name it and claim it. Whatever you want, if you just believe it hard enough, it'll happen. Prayer is, remember what I said a while ago, it's not about getting God to do your will. It's about aligning your will to his perfect will. 1 John chapter 5 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now, it's tempting to try to pray your will into this prayer and to, to slip that in there and get God to do what you want him to do. It makes me think of the guy who was, he was trying to do better and eat. He was on a diet uh, he, he'd been praying God would help him get his nutrition going. But one day he was really craving something sweet. And he knew he was going to be driving by the bakery. On the, he was on the street where the bakery was. And he prayed. He says, God, if you think it'd be okay for me to have some donuts today. He said, would you just make a parking spot right there on that street in front of the bakery? And he said, sure enough, eighth time around the block, there it was. <laughs> I went in and ate donuts. It's tempting to try to slip our will into these prayers. But now, there is a, a man in history that I'm fascinated by. His name is George Mueller. I greatly admire him as a man of prayer. I've done some reading about him. He was an evangelist and a director of a children's orphanage back in the 1800s. And there's so many stories of remarkable answers to his prayers that he saw. As a matter of fact, they found his prayer journal, and it's been said that they found uh, around 50,000 specific answers to prayer during his lifetime. Uh, it, it's amazing. But one of the things that I gleaned from him, he had like these points about prayer, and so I was wanting to learn anything I could from this guy. And, and I was fascinated by, he, he said this about removing his will from his prayers. He said, I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Nine-tenths of the trouble with people is just there. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever it may be. When one is truly in this state, it's usually but a little way to the knowledge of what his will is. We've got to get self out of the way when we pray. We've got to concentrate on the will of God. I encourage you, if you want to know the will of God, pray the word of God. John 15, 7 says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you if these words abide in you. And if God's word says that something is God's will, man, that's a place where you can draw a circle and take a stand. Amen. If God says, if you'll do this, I'll do this. Well, go do that and then draw your circle and stand in it in prayer and say, God, I'm, I'm praying, your word says, and I, I'm calling in that promise from your word today. And maybe you need to stand for weeks, for months, but if God says he will do it, he has never broken his word yet and he never will, amen? There comes a time to stand on the promises of our God. Again, Mueller says, he says, I see the will of the spirit of God through the word or in connection with the word of God. The spirit and the word must be combined. If I look to the spirit alone without the word, I lay myself open to great delusions also. 
If the Holy Spirit guides us at all, he will do according to the scriptures and never contrary to them. Listen, sometimes I hear people say, well, God told me this this morning. God told me this last night. And just arbitrarily say, God told me this, God told me this. Be careful because not every thought that you have is from God. Amen? Sometimes our, our flesh speaks to us. Sometimes it may be other spiritual forces speaking to us. Here's the standard to know whether it's from God or not. Be careful that when you say God is leading me, check this book first to make sure it's the right voice that you're hearing and it's truly from God. Now, with that said, pray in the spirit, the Bible says. Romans 8, 26, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There have been times in my life when I was praying over a situation, I'm like, honestly, I don't even know what to pray for. I don't know what would be the best thing here. Holy Spirit, you do. Will you tell the Father what needs to happen here? Would you help me pray a right prayer here in this situation? There have been other times in my life when I was so overcome with anxiety or so overcome with grief, whatever it might be, that I just said, God, I just, my mind's a mess. I can't get my thoughts together. Holy Spirit, would you pray on my behalf? You see, he is a friend that sits closer than a brother. He even helps us pray. And, and I believe that the, the greatest prayers, they, they don't originate in our heart. They originate in heaven. And the Holy Spirit leads us to what to pray. Amen? And he is our prayer partner. And as you grow in your faith, you'll become better at hearing and discerning the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Learn to let him guide you. In prayer. Next of all, and I'm, I'm, I'm hitting third and, and heading home here, so hang on. But pray with expectancy. James chapter 1 says, But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Sometimes I think we're guilty of saying, All we can do is pray. Oh, that's a pretty good option. Prayer is the best option. Hopefully that's the first option in our lives. Or we, we look at it kind of like we're, we're tossing a Hail Mary into the end zone and hoping something happens just on the chance that it might do some good. Listen, if the word of God says, if you will do this, I will do this, draw you a circle and pray and wait upon the Lord to do what he said that he would do. Pray with expectancy. The story is told that when Hudson Taylor sailed to China, he heard an urgent knock on the, the door of his room. He opened it, and there stood the captain of the ship. He said, Mr. Taylor, we have no wind. We're drifting toward an island where the people are heathen, and I fear they may be cannibals. Hudson Taylor said, well, what, what can I do? He said, I understand you believe in God, and you're a man of God. I, I want you to pray for wind. Hudson Taylor says, all right, captain, I will pray for wind if you will go and get the sails ready. In other words, if I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray expecting that God is going to move. For you not to go get those sails ready would be hypocritical. How often do we pray and we act as if it's probably not going to happen? But there's a whole difference when we pray. We pray rooted in the word and we claim a promise of God and we say, I draw my circle and I'm going to wait upon the Lord in his perfect timing to do with expectancy what I knew he said he would do. Now listen, I close with this question. What would happen? What would happen if we get serious as we talked last week about this book and we move to another level in our faith journey to where we don't just show up on Sunday morning and endure a 30-minute message about this book, but we get in this book ourselves and we open these pages and we begin to not just read it so we can check it off some to-do list and move on with their day, but we really meditate upon this word. Have you ever really had a season of your life where you got into this word and let it work in your heart? That's what I invite us to do. That's what we're going to start working on tonight at the, at the vineyard. I hope you'll come out for that. But what would happen if we not only get in this word, but we begin to pray this word? 
And we begin to pray it in faith. And when we find a promise of God and the, the, the will of God is clearly revealed, we draw a circle and we stand in it and we say, God, I'm going to pray until something happens. You know what I think would happen? I think we'd have revival. I think we pray often, God, would you send revival? And I think God's waiting on us to get serious about his book. He's waiting on us to hit our knees in prayer. He's waiting on us to invite the spirit of God to lead our lives. And friends, every revival that you read about in history, people got serious about their sin. They got serious about the word and they got serious about prayer. And the Holy Spirit comes running to scenes like that. I would love to see it. And I don't know about you, but... For me, and I want to encourage all of my household, that's what I want to be about in 2024. And I believe there's a core group of people in this church. I've seen them on the vine, and people say they're going to be here tonight. I know it's going to be cold. I've heard whether it's going to snow or not. I don't know. I plan on being here. If I have to walk, I'm going to be here tonight. Okay, 630. Dana said, you going to have that tonight if the weather gets bad? I said, I'm going to call the cows and feed the ones that come tonight at 630. I'm going to be here. Okay, Lord willing. But I'm coming with expectancy because I just believe if we get in this book and if we pray this book and we apply this book, the spirit of God will meet us and do something amazing. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us today. God, we, uh, we come today expecting. We come today in faith. Lord, I, I love this book. <laughs> it's amazing. I'll never get to the bottom of it. But Lord, what I do understand, I believe every word of it. Father, I pray that you will just build a remnant here in this church, in this community that loves your word, that applies your word, that prays your word, that lives your word, God. And Lord, I pray that you'll start a spark with that. Lord, would you, would you bring revival? Yeah, I'm gonna draw a circle and I just pray that you'll bring revival to that circle and Lord, maybe somebody else will do the same and Lord, I pray this church will be different at the end of 2024 than it is today. Father, I pray that Mercer County will be different at the end of 2024 and that the kingdom of God will be larger and deeper in 2024 than it is today. We need your Holy Spirit. Would you come? Would you come and move in their hearts? Lord, maybe, maybe today there's somebody that has never accepted Jesus as their Savior and their Lord. They've never begun life's most important journey, which is with you at the center. Would you give them a boldness to step out and say, that changes today. I want Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord. I want to live the rest of my life for his glory. God, would you move in this place today as we have need? Would you know every need in this room the ones that have been spoken to you and the ones that are unspoken. Lord, we want to be a people of prayer. We want to see your provision. We want to feel your power. We want to experience what it's like to live in harmony with you. Father, would you move among us? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand to our feet. If you want to accept Jesus, come see us over there. If you want to talk to somebody about a decision in your life or pray with somebody, come see us over there. But listen, on today of all days, Maybe you just feel led to come and pray in this place, right in this gathering. May this be a house of prayer. Even if things are, there's nothing wrong in your life, maybe you just want to come and say, God, I just want to praise you today and lift up your prayers. Won't you come and let's fill this house with the sweet aroma of prayer.